We start by visiting those counseling foundations and we look at something that is so important and it's going to be different depending on where you are based in the world. Now, we're based in the United Kingdom, so we work under the uh, legislation of the United Kingdom, but we're speaking about counseling and the law because it, it plays such an important part. Yeah, so I mean, it came as a bit of a revelation to me when I went for went to training, mm. and this this came up because it's something that I really never considered. I I, be, I believe that um, counselors were some s somewhat akin to priests or vicars who listen to people, and um, everything was said was kind of sacrosanct and and confidential, um, and in fact. Um, there are some exceptions to, and as Ken said, the UK law that we need to think about, but we also need to think about law in general. Counselling in the law isn't just about the exceptions to confidentiality. It's the laws we work to and we have to, um, we have to abide by. And, of course, one of those laws is the General Data Protection Act of 2018. We need to protect clients' data. We need to do due diligence to make sure that confidential information, be it stored on paper or on, on your phone or on your, your electronic device, is secure and doesn't get into the public domain. And for those counsellors who are qualified colleagues, um, there is a there is a uh, you know a, a kind of expectation that they'll register with the Information Commissioner's Office that you have to pay a small fee, um, and and that you will abide by that law. So I think. I think when we think of counselling in the law, there's lots of different laws we have to think about. And of course, you know, another one would be health and safety legislation. You know, if we're, um, you know, if we're working in our own home um, and a client comes in, we'd have to make sure that our house was safe for somebody to be in. We want someone tripping over something or, um, you know, maybe being electrocuted, switch a light switch on and it was faulty. So those are, are some kind of laws, I think, that sometimes go under the radar, Ken. Yes, and, and, and I'd like to add into that the Equalities Act, uh, where, where we are seeing all people as human beings on this mm. fellow journey with us and not discriminating. And I think that the legislation is generally there for very good reason. It's from where things have gone wrong or where people have been discriminated against and, and pain has been caused that uh, Parliament meets and they create laws to... Uh, to how how we work ourselves uh, around that. Now, the interesting thing is when we look at legislation, legislation is not a nice to have. Uh, it is an imperative. It's not an ethical imperative. It is a legal imperative. Mm. Imperative, sorry. And we, we don't get a choice in it. And um, not understanding the law or not knowing that the law exists, unfortunately, is not a defense for not following the law. That's one of the things about the law is you, you can't, well, I didn't know that uh, I needed to protect uh, the client's data. I didn't know that I needed to to register with the, to, to register with the ICO. There is still going to be a, an outcome uh, to that. So it, it is not a defense to go, well, I didn't know that existed. And and I think as practitioners, you know, we, we, we are in a profession, this is a profession. Uh, and in a profession, uh, going back to the original meaning, we profess an oath, uh, we, 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 we are held to standards. And, and part of those standards is that we have an understanding of what the law is. And of course, when you study counseling formally, you will go through the law. But that is the law at that time, you know, and we speak so often about our CPD, our continuing professional development. It is up to us to keep an eye on any changes within legislation so that we are aware of it, so that we can uh, integrate that into our practice if need be. And I think that it's uh, it, 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 it's interesting because it's reading reading government websites and looking at the law is not the most fun thing and it's maybe not even on the radar for for so many you might but but it's so important we need to we have to we're called on by the law and by our profession to do so yes absolutely and i think that um hopefully those colleagues who are student colleagues who are working in placements um, their placements should take care of this within the contract because I, I think it's I think it's apt to say at this point, Ken, that any laws need to be in the contract so the client can make an informed decision. Now, things like health and safety legislation, 
I don't think would make it into a contract, but certainly things like general data protection, um, you know, and saying that, you know, you, you work under the general data protection regulations and how a, a client's data is stored. And, and there are some specific laws that we need to think about. And I'm just going to have a look um, at, at my handout here, which is, which we'll share with, which we share with you. I'll give you details of that a little later on in the podcast. So the terrorism act, money laundering regulations, money laundering, terrorist financing and transfer of funds regulations and the drug trafficking acts. These are all exceptions to confidentiality. Now, what I would say is that generally speaking, it's very unlikely that you would a client would actually disclose terrorism. Um, however, it's very possible that the relative of a client you're seeing, you know, so you're seeing a client and one of their relatives may be involved in terrorism. And I was very interested to learn when I was training that the reason this was put in was for the time when there was a very difficult time in Northern Ireland. Some people could still say there's difficult times in, 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 in Northern Ireland. Um, and therapists were, were working with clients of um, with clients whose relatives may have been imprisoned for terrorist offences, and um, something was discussed. Maybe it's a prison visit, or maybe within the family. Yeah. And it, it put a it put an onus on the therapist to have to disclose it. And that's that's the real. I think that's the real history of it. Um, so those should be in the contracts, and I think it's important that. Anybody who who is writing a contract has an understanding of what what the laws are and what crucially what do you do if you believe somebody has broken these laws. I think that's an interesting one. Do we run out of the, the therapy room and call the police immediately? Hmm. What do we do in these cases, Ken? <laughs> Hmm. Well, I, and I think that this just highlights the importance of that contract and the importance of laying this information out before you get into any client material hmm. and having informed consent on that contract, having a signature or some indication that you can evidence back to that this that the, the, the client has agreed to the information that has been shared and and this is a great case in point that you mentioned now, Rory. So if I, I'll tell you how I am on this. If, if I was in a session and uh, somebody mentioned that they were involved in or had knowledge of an act of terrorism, then I think that it would be safe to say that me making any mention of the fact that I was going to pass this information on because I have to break confidentiality, because I am required to by legislation, could put my life at risk and it mm. could put the, my family's life at risk yeah. because it may uh, it may trigger that 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 uh, a, a stop no we don't want this information out and and when we're speaking about an act of terrorism we're, we we are talking about organized individuals that have uh, uh, significant resources around them so i wouldn't be mentioning it in the session and the reason i wouldn't be mentioning it in the session is because i would have outlined this in the contract it would have been mentioned before we started our client's engagement and in my contract i'm not reading from it now so i'm speaking just from mem memory it, it it goes along the lines of um i would need to break com confidentiality if you were to mention knowledge of or involvement in an act of terrorism Full stop. I then go on to say, I would not in our session discuss this with you. It is discussed in this contract. I would then just need to report that on without even telling you. And again, full stop. And again, I'm, I'm just kind of paraphrasing from memory what, what is in that contract. We, we need to look to our, our, our safety uh, and the safety of our family in those kind of situations. But if you've covered that in your initial contracting, then surely the individual, you would cover it in your contract, you would check the understanding of your contract with that person before any client engagement starts. They then have the boundaries of, of the session. They know what will happen if they do bring that information because you've already shared that with them. I don't know what you would do, Rory. Well, I mean, I, 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 I think exactly the same thing. In a very unlikely event that some, but that's a client um, disclosed that you know that they're involved in or have been involved in an act of terrorism, 
I think I'd, I'd go along the lines of your thinking, Ken. Um, my view would be that, you know, I've outlined the contract, that I've checked their understanding of the limits of confidentiality, and then I could take a view of, of what to do. And I think the one that used to come up a lot for students was the Drug Trafficking Act. Oh, yes. Um, and, and there's a bit of a debate here. Drug trafficking is the movement, as far as I understand it, of huge amounts of drugs it's not somebody selling um you know a, a little bit of shall we say a little bit of cannabis which is illegal let me be yes. really clear on that making no judgments on this but it is illegal so i think you have you have to use a little bit of wisdom on this there's a big difference between someone you know selling a you know half an ounce of cannabis and someone importing a wagon load of cocaine i think i think that it, it is it is there is a difference um and also, you're going to be able to draw where you can if it's not an emergency situation on your supervisor and the ethics hub of your uh, ethical body. That's why it's so important to have be a member of an ethical body. It's one of those reasons <laughs> what you, it's what you pay your money for because you can contact the ethics hub and talk it through with someone, and they can give you they can give you a view. They don't tell you what to do, but they can give you a perspective and from that perspective you then have you can then have and make a decision i'd also like to point out that there are some glaring omissions from the the legal confidentiality one is disclosing harm to children hmm. because as we stand in the uk at the moment and i think a lot of people we've talked about this on the podcast before there is no statutory legislation for an independent practitioner i'm going to make this really clear to disclose harm to children. If you're working within a school or you're working within a setting that looks after children, then there is, it's covered under the Children's Act. Um, so a lot of therapists like myself have an overarching um, part of the contract that says harm to self or harm to others. Yeah. And I think that's really, really important. I learned that very early when I was a placement uh, counsellor. and that they, they used to have it on the walls of the therapy room when I worked at Mind, I seem to remember, uh, disclosure of anything that's harm to self or harm to others. And that was a big relief because it meant it took the burden of the decision from me. I was working under the organisation and that was the organisation's policy. And I took that into my own private practice when I went into private practice. Because what happens if you have a situation where you had a client who turned up under the influence of alcohol or or, or drugs, and he knew they were driving a vehicle. You know, I personally, my personal view would be if somebody, I would ask them, you know, you know, can I get you a taxi? Could you leave your keys? And if they were, if they were driving, my personal view is that I, I couldn't live with myself if that person drove a vehicle and, and, and hurt or killed somebody. Mm. I would break confidentiality for that. Other therapists may take a different view, Ken. Yeah. And, and and I guess we, we now go into that area uh, where it becomes, uh, I, I guess, tricky from the way that we're not we're not given law that we have to follow. So in in the instance you're speaking about somebody that is under the clearly under the influence of alcohol and they're going to leave your session, go and jump in their car. Um, it is against the law, as you've said, but it we're not called on to break confidentiality if somebody breaks the law. We are called on under certain legislation to break confidentiality yes. and this and this is where it is this is where it, it it becomes about you your practice and how you run that and the exclusions that you might uh, uh, put into your contract of, of when you might need to step in when you mean might need to act when you might need to break confidentiality but just going back to the law uh, when you were speaking about drugs trafficking <clears throat> it's up to us to have a look at drug trafficking legislation. Now, it doesn't mean we have to understand the intricacies of it, but we should be able to understand it to a point that we can explain it to a client. It's up to us to understand terrorism and money laundering regulations. Again, not that we have the intimate details of the law. Uh, I mean, if you get you find yourself in a situation where you, you feel, do I now need to break confidentiality? As Rory has said, you can, you can seek uh, advice from your ethical body um but so that we can explain it to a client and so that we can understand it ourselves so if we don't have an understanding 
and per, per, per chance a uh, a client says my partner is uh, dealing cannabis on a corner, we we might think we have to break confidentiality. It may be inappropriate breaking of confidentiality, and it can have ramifications for that person, for that client. It could cause harm to them for the mm -hmm. ramifications that come in from that. So we need to tread carefully. Now, Rory has mentioned, and I'm going to mention this again, that he's prepared a handout for for this episode and this i think is one of the one of the more important handouts so if, you, if you're not in the, the practice of of going over to our website and getting the handouts from each of, of the episodes i i i suggest go and get this one no matter what your level of practice and the reason is it's got some really good um useful links there the terrorism hotline crime stoppers terrorism and money laundering regulation there is a link to the government website where you can go and you can spend an hour looking over it so that you educate yourself on what that really means drug trafficking legislation there is a link to the website once again you can go and have a look at that and just inform yourself there's a link to the data Pre uh, protection act uh, also BACP guidance on GDPR and the Equalities Act on the government website. So this is all UK based. If you're based in the UK, these are good links to have. These are really good links to have if you find yourself in a, in a position of not knowing, wondering, uh, these links are a great starting place. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, your own supervisor, you know, yeah. go and speak to your supervisor if you're unsure. And, you know, if you're unsure, speak to um, your ethical body, their ethics hub. And, and there's lots of information in difficult, dif difficult different awarding bodies, um, ethical bodies, and you'll be able to go there and they'll be able to, uh, they'll be able to advise you. And, and I think I'd, I'd like to kind of, as we end this kind of topic, not leave people worrying too much. In, in the 20 years I've been practising, I have to say that I've never come across any breaking of confidentiality for any laws um apart apart from um the harm to self and harm to others which is yeah. not a law it's written into the contract i think i think the i think the the, 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 the um, therapists who, who break the law be, uh, break confidentiality because of the the legislation are very few and far between but i think when you do that probably uh, probably is a no going back to your uh, client because I think once the client finds out that they'll, they'll work it out one way or another, I would imagine, then um, it, it would have an impact on the relationship. But we're bound by the law; we we haven't got a choice. Yeah, it's it's interesting when we when we speak um, on on the podcast, Rory. How often we mention the word contract? I think if we take all of our podcast episodes. Yes. And, and kind of used an artificial algorithm to look <laughs> through it and find the word contract is probably one of the most commonly uttered phrases. And, and the reason is it is so, so important. It is the grounding to everything we do. And, you know, we end this, this, this topic um, by, by saying, you know, cover it in your contract so that the, the, the client knows and maybe it's because it is well covered in contract, Rory, that it hasn't been mentioned. Uh, you know, because it lets the person know, don't, don't go there, don't go there, because it puts us in the position where we where we have to break confidentiality. No therapist wants to break no. confidentiality. It is the cornerstone of what we offer. But at the same time, no therapist wants there to be potential harm and danger to anybody under mm -hmm. any circumstance. We need to educate ourselves. Um, the links are in the, uh, the, the the handout. We need to build it into our contract. We need to make sure we have informed consent, informed consent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, that that if anything should 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 come of this, we're able to go back and, and and evidence that this was agreed to and covered by the client. 